be sensitive to what he want to say. Amen. So what I'm talking about is this. Sometime, um, well, not sometime, but today we are entering an, into a new uh, series. It's called the house that love built. The house that love built. So whenever there is a new series, that means there is a new thing that God wants to show us. And unless we quickly set our mind and attention and, and our mindset into the new topic, we might miss the blessing that God wants to show us. And every time God wants to speak something, there must be some blessing, spiritual blessing that he wants to, spiritual truth that he wants to reveal to us. So, so that is the ability I'm talking about, the skill. Quickly set our mind to the new series, and, and this series is called The House that built that love built so we will talk about this particular subject for the next three four weeks and i ask the congregation to set our mind into that topic as we move into this new series uh, one of the most exciting role that i have as a pastor is when couples come to me for a premarital counseling there will be soon in this church, there are two new couples that are going to enter into a new season in their lives. Uh, the person that I talk to is probably, yeah, that's me, that's me. But we will celebrate that uh, in the next month or two, uh, uh, two new couples in our church. And so before they enter into the marriage, they usually come to the pastor, to me, and to some others that they ask for premarital counseling. So I suggest if any one of you are still in a uh, I don't see any uh, potential new couple. All of, all of us are married except one person, two person, or something like that. But I will say that in an in afternoon service in, in Penol, because there are a lot of unmarried couples, unmarried people. Uh, yeah, just to, even if you are already married, sometimes it's worth to just review again the material. In there, we talk about, uh, we plan, you know, uh, the plan. Uh, about potential challenges, how to communicate. It's a long hours, a long, many, many meetings, like six to eight meetings. Uh, and uh, so we pastor have to sit there and just listen and then to, to just provide feedback. It's a lot of work, but the knowledge that you are playing a small part in building and shaping the foundation of their future makes every session, every word spoken become profoundly meaningful to me. Personally, uh, in those, in those moments, all the tiredness, fatigue just fades away because your heart is filled with, with deep sense of uh, fulfillment, that you are playing part in, in building this new family. Amen? So, um, what they are, in short, what they are doing uh, in, in sitting with me and with some others is they're planning their future home, their future family. They, where they, they pray and expect the, the relationship will flourish and life become fruitful and wonderful. So that's why we, we sit together, just plan, dream, talk about how many children you want to have, where do you want to live, what kind of household budget you're looking at, and that kind of thing. Building a home. Building a home. Everybody say, building a home. Building a home. That is actually what Jesus wants to do. He wants to build a home. So we will talk about that subject and how he wants to build a home, what kind of home he wants to build. Um, that is what we will uh, explore and who he wants to participate and what kind of role. We talk about role and responsibility in the premarital counseling also. What is the role of husband? What is the role of the wife? What is the... Uh, you know, well, we don't talk about children that much, but children do play a role also in their family. So I want to show you the verse that we want to talk about in the next. I don't know if that doesn't look like. Oh, there we go. I'm a little confused with that particular slide. I did not put it in there, but somehow it's there. But anyway, Ephesians 4, chapter 11 to 16, we have read this before, we will dig into this more today and in coming weeks. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16. I will read it to you. You read it inside of your heart. This is the word of God. So Christ himself 
gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, and teachers. These are position in the church. Christ himself to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ, the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, that's number one, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, that's number two, and become mature, that's number three. And to summarize those three, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ, that is the goal, and, and the Apostle Paul, who wrote this, break it down. Unity in the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. And when you read this, when you read, so that the body of Christ may be built up, you can sense, if you have not, maybe you should, sense a desire of Jesus to build up the body of Christ, something called the body of Christ. Everybody say the body of Christ. There is a desire for him because he wants to build up all of us to become mature, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. God's desire is to build up the body of Christ, and most of us understand what it means. The body of Christ is the church. It is the gathering of the believers. When you hear the body of Christ building the body of Christ, some of us may think of it as, as it sounds formal. Wow, building the body of Christ. Uh, you know, we preachers sometimes overly, uh, you know, use this big word of planting a church. Uh, this is the study of ecclesiology. It all sounds very formal. And, and, but actually behind those declarations, you should be able to feel the deep and passionate love toward us. You should be able to feel that, that if you picture a man loving a woman, his fiance, say, and said, I want to build our home together. I want to build a family. Your perception from this formal church planting, building a corporate body, a body of church, organization, or even physical building, you can see behind it, actually, there's a passion and love of God toward his people. The verse that I want to share to you is this. The Bible used the word husband. Your, for your maker is your husband. It's very relational. It is actually passion. I can feel the love of a potential uh, a husband that is in, in my room doing premarital counseling. There is that, that burning passion. I want to be with you. I want to build a family with you toward the wife. And I think that should be also not the attitude of the uh, almost married person, but all of us who are husband already, right? We need to love passionately and deeply. And God is saying, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. It's very relational. It's very passionate. I'm your husband, God says. I'm your husband. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives. And in comparison to that familial relationship, he said, just as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her. In that word husband, in that role as a husband, there are a deep, meaningful, passionate relationship along with all that it means to be a husband. Think about God that way. That way you don't think of, oh, building a church is something corporate or something um, formal because it is definitely formal probably in one way, but it is more relationship than formal. Suddenly, the idea of God wanting to build his church become profoundly relational, akin to the deep love and commitment shared between husband and wife. That's what God wants to do. It transformed the concept of being distant, you know, institutional, into passionate, 
loving relationship between a creator husband to his people, us. This, just like a man envision the future life in this family. Filled with love, support, shared dream. God desired to build his church that way. Just like a potential husband sitting in my room doing premarital counseling, in his mind is nothing corporate. I just want to build a life. I just want to build a family, a place that I can dwell with my beloved wife. God's dwelling place, that's what we're talking about. God's dwelling place. God wants to build a dwelling place, a family. God wants a home. A house is just a physical structure. Home is where the connection, relationship, and all the richness of life takes place. A home is where sweet memories are made, a sense or belonging our own. A home is where relationship between the member, where laughter, tears are shared, dream and vision are formed together, and success and failures are born together. We bear each other weaknesses and we enjoy each other success and victory. Ezekiel chapter 32, I don't know if you're here, maybe, yes. My dwelling place, God says, will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. A dwelling place, a place that God wants to dwell. Dwell means stay, dwell means lingering around. Dwell means be in one place together. That's dwell. And this dwelling place is not a building, it's not an organization, but, is, but in you, in me, in us. God says, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. He built this place as a dwelling place, a home, where his presence dwells. Don't you know that you, yourself, together, that's a plural you, you know, sometimes we read English or Indonesian Bible, we miss the plural or singular, but in this case it is in plural, all of us, you, God says, don't you know that you, together, yourself, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst, in the middle of this gathering of people, God's dwell. This is God's dwelling place. This is God's home. That is what he wants to build. And in this kind of environment where God's built, what are the blessings and benefits we find ourselves when we are in this dwelling place? What happened when God dwell in this place. Just like a family, when God dwells in this place, there's a place of security, a place of security. Psalm chapter 27 verse 5 says this, for the day of trouble, for in the day of trouble, which means when we are in trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. That is a picture. Tent is a picture of safety that protect you from the elements, the cold and the hot. That's a tent. A high place protect you from flood. You go to the higher place. That's a picture that probably some of us are not uh, cannot identify so easily because we don't live in tent and we don't live in a flood area but that is a picture that the writer of Psalm bring up to his reader at the time and for us it simply means a place of safety, a security I mean, safety and security a place of security life is unpredictable if I ask you what threaten the life of your family right now. If you look around you, I mean, I think it's wise for, for a family to recognize the threat. What kind of threat in your mind 
that can threaten the life of your family. Think about it for a while because unless we know the threat, we will never be ready for it. What is the threat to your life? What is the threat for your family? Anybody want to offer a suggestion? What kind of threat are you facing nowadays in this life for your family? How about layoffs? Job layoffs. So for those of you who work, is that a threat? A threat to your financial stability, right? That's one of them. Anybody else can suggest what is the threat to the life of your family? For, you know, for, for example, I, I have to kind of continue a little bit on that. If you know that financial threat is the, the threat to your family, what should you do? I guess save, right? Save money. Not, ex, not uh, splurge on things that you do not need. Maybe if until your saving is built up, keep control over your vacation spending, right? A lot of people wants to go everywhere because Instagram and uh, Facebook just show off the whole thing that the possibility of enjoyment that you can possibly get, but not necessarily, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes family go to <coughs> Disneyland and come back very, very tired instead of relax, right? So um, you have to choose wisely which is the most valuable vacation, the kind that you can have with your limited amount of fam uh, money. But saving money is one of the ways that you expect and handle financial threat. What else? What about all kind of different philosophies that are circling around today and affecting your children? That is a threat. Those of us who have children, we know it. All kind of cancel culture, wokeism, and even the culture of disbelief. Yeah? That is a threat. You want your children to be faithful, successful in God, but the reality of today's world is that all kind of philosophy are so easily accessible, even without the parents knowing, right? They can easily look at Instagram, watch some kind of movie, and their exposure to uh, teachers from school that can teach them the wrong kind of things that, that threaten the, the future of your children. That is a threat. How do you handle that? To me, the way I handle that is I make sure my children is belonging to some kind of local church wherever they are. And they attend, if they are small, go to Sunday school so that the teacher have a chance to impart biblical values to their life. If they're a little bit older, make sure that they really understand the word of God. They stand upon the truth of, what, of the word of God. Have them go to Bible study. If you are able, then you, you give Bible study. I give Bible study to my children, you know, along with my sisters, so that it kind of get the momentum. They're sitting around with their cousins. And we, we study the word of God together. Uh, there was a time like that, um, one season in our life, we study who Jesus is uh, and what he has done for us. That kind of Bible study. Do Bible study with your children so that they are firmly rooted in the Bible study. That's uh, in the word of God. That's how I, I face that threat. But the word of God says, when you are in the dwelling house of God, there is safety. Right? There is safety. When we are in the midst of us, we encourage one another, we pray for one another, we remind one another to be faithful to God. That's where safety is. Safety is not just simply sitting passively in a, in a hole somewhere and forgetting how to live. Safety is where we are together in the house of God. And we face together the challenge of life. And we address the threats like what I just did. There, were, there are many more. But together, we'll figure it out. But as long as we are together, God says there is safety in his dwelling. And this is the dwelling. When we think about dwelling, we're thinking about heaven. Oh, some kind of uh, whatever multidimensional, another dimension of life. No, we are talking about here. Right here is the dwelling place of God. 
How many understand this so far? Amen? A place of security. In the day of trouble, when you are in the trouble, God says, I will protect you if you are in the dwelling. In the dwelling place of God. The second one, what kind of benefit, what kind of place that God wants to build is the place of rest. Everybody say rest. Rest. Resting is the state of relaxing. In addition to being secure and safe, there is a supernatural peace. When you are restful, you are peaceful. And vice versa. When you are peaceful, you are restful. And in the world where so much pressure from our environment is exerting on our lives, we need rest. We need a place of where we just feel secure, relax, and know that you are loved and accepted. That's a church. God's dwelling place. God says in Isaiah, my people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Weekly, you experience this rest. Sabbath is called the day of rest. This is the place of rest where right now, hopefully, you're not thinking about your job. You're not thinking about your school. You just want to sit here, enjoy God's presence. You just want to sit here, enjoy the richness of His Word. This is the place of rest. This is the dwelling of God. You are hopefully restful, not thinking about the laundry that you have not finished at home, right? Or the kids that still need to do the homework that you need to help, or the planning for the future. Hopefully you are restful and just, God, I'm at peace. And this peace does not come with you playing trick with your mind. This peace is supernatural in origin. It is from heaven, go to your life, in the dwelling place. Hallelujah. Rest, a place of rest, a place of security, a place of rest, a place of enjoyment, a place of enjoyment. This is the verse that we read during our offering time. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. One thing that I seek, that I seek and that I may dwell in the house. David wrote this. this. This house of the Lord must be an exciting place. Some place that give him, oh, I'm, I'm so joyful in this place. I want to be there every day. Of course, this temple that David was talking about was destroyed by the Roman Empire several times, actually. Uh, it destroyed by the Babylonian in the uh, 586 BC, and then it got rebuilt, and then destroyed again by the Roman, one of the uh, crazy uh, uh, Caesar in the AD 70, and, and it's no longer there. So what is talking about then? If the word of God is true uh, from beginning to the end of time, then this still must be true, the word of David. I enjoy, I do seek, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord every day of my life. What does that mean? It must be dwelling in the midst of God's people, His dwelling place. It must be mean, mean that. If that is true today, it means I find joy in the midst of God's people. To seek the Lord's beauty. What does that mean? Can you see the face of God? Obviously, His spirit, there's no physical face. But he does have manifestation in the person that sits next to you. The beauty of the Lord. I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at you now. I see the beauty of God inside of you. Look at the person next to you. <coughs> Come on. Look at the person next to you. Even the person that you don't like that much. <laughs> and say this. I see the beauty of the Lord. I see the beauty of the Lord in you, right? Amen. This is the place of enjoyment. That's why David wants to be there because he see at that time we interpreted that, that he meant the presence of God in the temple. But we now know 
after the New Testament, it was revealed to us that that the temple is us. This dwelling place is us. Now we understand more. There's more picture in our mind. What does it mean to enjoy the beauty of the Lord? Is to enjoy His beauty in the life of the people that together dwell in God's presence. In a healthy church, we are easily in awe of God's beauty. If this place is healthy, if this is God's dwelling place, it should not be difficult to see God's wonderful work in the life of the people. We appreciate one another, we love one another, we bear burden together, we see the wonderful hands of God in the life of the people. Last week I went to the retreat and I want to report to you I'm so joyful in that retreat because I dwell in the midst of the young people, that is the house of God, the, the place, the dwelling place of God. I mean, all this, you have to understand, we, we expected 50 people to be there, 80 people, 85 people was there. So the place was small, cramped. But it doesn't diminish, it didn't diminish the joy of the people. And granted, this is our new people, you know. These are the new people that are probably 18, 19 years old, 20 years old, UC Berkeley students, uh, DVC students, and, and uh, some South Bay people were there. And they experience the touch of the Holy Spirit. There are new salvation, people that just believe in God. There are decisions for baptism. Yesterday we baptized some, uh, one person. In the coming week there will be more. It's because they are touched by God in the midst of the dwelling of God. Many, many receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speak in tongue and cry and just surrender life. Just like our past retreat. And the beauty of this is this. Almost no L1, L2 leaders. Some L2 leaders. Maybe very minimum L1. But the whole retreat was run by these young people. I didn't even involve in planning. The whole leadership, and some of you know who you are, were not even there. We're not even there. These are run by students, by their care group leaders who are not official position in any way in this church. But they have that kind of vision and love to build the house of God. And the house of God is the people. And everybody was so excited. 85 people were there. We expect, oh, this is just student population. Not many are interested. But lo and behold, God is raising, like what you sang before, raising a generation of people, young people. Amen? How many say amen to that? The last one, the home that, that God wants to build will benefit us as a place of shared experience. Everybody say shared experience. Rome chapter 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. How many know that your sorrow, is your burden is lighter when born together? Your joy is multiplied when shared. That's how husband and wife is. In life, me and my wife, we, we had challenges. But burden felt lighter. Because you have someone to share. If by yourself, sometimes you're stuck. You feel, oh man, life is so difficult. But with a wife, with someone to share, it feels lighter. You know, if one person said, Oh, I'm so discouraged. I don't think we can do that. The other person can say, let's bring it to prayer. God can do this together. We can do this together. You know, encourage one another. Even the burden is the same, but with a bigger heart when you, are, you get encouraged, things will settle. A lot of things that, that we think that we cannot do, actually it's all in our mind. It's all, oh, this is too hard. And when your mind already telling that this is too hard, you cannot do this, your action will reflect what you believe. You will believe, oh, this is too hard. There's no way I can success. But when somebody said, we can do this together, I will bear this burden together with you. And lo and behold, your mind starting to believe, yes, I can. Yes, we can. With God, nothing is impossible. 
that's how it is. It's a shared experience. When we're together, it will bring you further in life, greater measure of success. If you are alone, yeah, I guess a lot of people argue, I can believe in Jesus when I'm by myself. I don't need other people. Yeah, sure. By God's grace, you can up to a certain level. But if you want to go further, you better be together. How many understand this? So the person that is sitting next to you is given by God to you so that you can travel further, go higher in life. Make you believe, and when you believe, you can conquer all kind of life, difficulty, and burden. And joy, how many want to celebrate birthday by yourself at home? Oh, yeah, you can. You just buy a cake and, and burn a candle. You can do that. But how sad it is, right, to sit by yourself, you know, looking at the cake, nobody cares. But yesterday, in my care group, people bring three cakes, three cakes, not only one, three cakes to celebrate our birthday. What a joy. What a joy. Laughter, shared, and, and your joy become multiplied. You just become more thankful to God, more thankful to life, because people are celebrating with you. It's a place of shared experience. Praise the Lord. So what should we do then? We are co-workers, you know. God wants us to build this place. It is, yes, he initiated, granted. Jesus said, I will build my church, my family, my dwelling place. But God says, you are my co-worker. I mean, a husband cannot, <clears throat> a husband cannot say, <clears throat> excuse me, a husband cannot say, I want to build, but the wife said, no. Just, okay, if you want to build, you go build. No. A wife has to say, okay, let's do this together. Amen? The same with our husband, our maker. God says, I want to build. We cannot say, okay, you build, God. No. We need to be a co-worker with him so that this home can be built. We are co-worker in God's service and you are God's field, God's building. Paul said this. He is one of the builders of the church. And he's saying, come on, let's build together. We are all co-workers. How do we participate? And this is where I will end our message today. How do we participate in some of the practical things that I, I can think of? There are many, many things for sure. But for this season, I just want to say you, uh, tell you these three things that, that I think how we participate in building uh, our home together with God, our husband. Number one, pray and make every effort for unity. Live in harmony with one another. That's the one, that, one verse that we read earlier. Live in harmony with one another. What does it mean? One of the blessings I have given all for 30 years is this. God continually send new people to our midst. I mean, some of you who have been here more than one year, two years, five years, ten years, you can, you can uh, testify about this truth. God continually send new people to our, our surrounding. New students always come. Last semester, uh, 75, just 75 new people come to our church. And along with these new people, of course, there are challenges, right? Some new people or people that you just met, you can relate to some, you cannot relate. And that's the given when you come to know some new people, that's the reality. God is creative in that way. We are unique in that way, right? But nevertheless, even though you cannot relate to the people that God brought to this church, God loves them, right? God loves them. So we need to love them too. So God says, that's, that's why this verse is given. Live in harmony, knowing that people uh, in the early church came from different environment, different, different culture. There's a lot of Greeks and there's a lot of Romans live in different city, in Turkey, in Jerusalem, in, in Antioch, in Antioch, and all kind of these people came together in Jerusalem. They didn't know before, but because of the Holy Spirit, come over them and they become one church. There are many, many unique personalities in that church. 
God says live in unity and harmony. The same with us too. God is going to bring many, many new people in our midst. And that's the tradition for 30 years. In the last 30 years that, that I have been pastor of this church, I know that I have to deal with unique personality every season. God says live in harmony. Accept them. Love them nevertheless. Pray and ask for spiritual gifts. Our endeavor in building God's hope is not human's endeavor. It's God endeavor. He, it is his, his idea. It is his house. The word of God says, So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. This is not human strength. It's God's idea. He will supply the gifts. Yes, some of the gifts that we are familiar with, the gift of administration, the gift of, of singing and, and playing music, but there are many, many more. Some of you have not probably been exposed to this. For example, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues, the gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, which is different than faith. The gift of faith, something that you probably have not differentiated between the two. We'll, we'll talk about that in the coming season. The gift of knowledge, the word of wisdom. Those are the gifts, supernatural gifts, that are given to you and I as God's dwelling place. Don't think, oh, this is just an organization. Okay, somebody have to do this, somebody have to preach, somebody have to sing, somebody have to answer. There are more than that. This is a spiritual place. Yes, is it an organization? Yes, it is. But is it a supernatural place? Yes, it is. God will supply the spiritual gifts as necessary. Last one, but not least, pray for and support your leaders. First Thessalonian, First Thessalonian, chapter five. Now, Paul and his leadership team ask you, people in Thessalonian and in Penol, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those. I ask you to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you, advise you, correct you. That's what it means, admonish. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. A leader, your leaders in care group, in ministry, they are just people who are just willing to serve. They have their own limitation in strength, in knowledge, in wisdom, in endurance. We must pray for them. How many have ever prayed for your care group leaders? How many ever pray for your ministry leaders? How many ever pray for your pastors? If you have not, please pray for them. Pray for them. They need your prayer. They need your su support. Because if they serve joyfully, you receive blessing joyfully from them. The fruits of their labor in building God's dwelling place, you will also feel. So please pray for them. Encourage them. Encourage them with your willingness to work together with them. Do you always have to like them? Probably not. Maybe you have a different uh, way of doing things, different philosophy of leadership. Maybe God calls you to be a different kind of leaders. Wait for your turn. If you know how to appreciate and work together with your current leader, later on you will understand how much you appreciate when you are a leader yourself. How much you need the support of your people so that you can accomplish what God wants you to accomplish to build His church, His body. So even before you are a leader, pray for your leader. Amen. So this is my final encouragement with you. I, I, I encourage you to respond to the call of your husband to build together our dwelling place. Let us build a home to our soul, our spiritual dwelling place, our spiritual family. A good quote I got is this. Every brick laid, every prayer whispered, and every act of kindness shared is a step 
start building God's dwelling place among us, a sanctuary of love and compassion. Everything that you do, every prayer you utter, every support that you show your leaders, every bond of unity that you create, relationship with the new people, that's how you build. Amen. Let's all stand. Oh